Although I should put spoiler warnings on all my videos, I don't normally, because it's normally pretty obvious. However, this week, there's a massive spoiler warning in effect, especially as one of the points I'm bringing up this week is pretty much the ending of this film. So if you haven't watched this film, be warned, because I don't like the ending. Anyway, back to what I normally do. Well, I'm Berryman, and this is 10 Things Wrong With. No Time To Die is a 2021 spy film and the 25th in the James Bond series, produced by Eon Productions. The film tells the story of James Bond, a retired MI6 secret agent who is lured back into service by his old friend Felix Leiter to take down an old organisation. However, more dangers are around the corner. When the film was released, it received generally positive reviews and also grossed over $774 million worldwide. But that does not mean that this is a perfect film. What do I mean it's not a perfect film? Well, allow me to explain 10 things wrong with No Time To Die. Number 10, Standalone. This is more of a criticism of Daniel Craig's tenure as James Bond rather than this individual film but in all the films, this has this biggest flaw, that the fact that James Bond films should pretty much be standalone. It shouldn't have this whole multi-story arc. Leave that to the Marvel films. But James Bond films, James Bond films are the films that come out that everyone loves, they think they're great, and then they come on every Christmas where everyone slags them off. But that's the beauty of James Bond films. You can pick up any James Bond film don't need to understand the history, you don't need to understand the films beforehand, you can just pick it up and watch it. This is the biggest flaw that Daniel Craig's James Bond tenure has. For example, his best film was Skyfall, which was a standalone film. The stats prove that I am right on this occasion, which is a very rare thing, but yeah, Going forward, whoever takes over as James Bond, whoever's next, can we go back to the old fashioned thing of having each James Bond film as a standalone film, not this overarching story? Number nine, length. Another thing that's good about James Bond films, like I said in a previous entry, you can pick them up, watch them, put them down, done. They're only a couple of hours long, except for this film is two hours, 43 minutes long which is an extraordinary amount of time for a James Bond film. Now, sometimes you say, yes, but it's 10, 15, 20 minutes worth of ending credits. Not in this film. In fact, the ending credits were only five minutes long, which is quite quick for modern day films. So yeah, to over two and a half hours of this film. It did feel like it was being dragged on. It just dragged on for so long. And I was struggling, really struggling because yeah, James Bond films, they're quick, easy films. Hell, you could watch the first two James Bond films in the same amount of time of watching this film. Number eight, continuity. We're not gonna be talking about between films. I've already discussed that, we'll leave that there. I'm actually talking about the film itself in a particular scene where the camera anger changes and it doesn't tally up. Now, I noticed this quite a few times and when I was writing my script for this, I had them all written down before I just screwed them out and put them all under one. Now, I'm gonna give you two examples because these are the two I picked up before I stopped looking out for these. In the pre-title opening sequence, the camera's zooming across their hotel room. You can quite clearly see James Bond is on top of her only for a fraction of a second, and then the frame changes, and she's on top. And it's like, that, that, stu that, no, that is so there is people paid to look out for mistakes like that, and they missed that one, but it wasn't the only one. Another example, when they're in a car, her phone is ringing. She goes to pick it up, the camera angle changes, and then she's just staring at James Bond, not picking it up. There was quite a lot of these issues throughout this film, now, if it was an amateur production or a low budget production, I could sort of understand that they're trying to keep the cheapest people, but the fact that this is a high powered film that they delayed for a few years because of COVID, and I understand why they did that, but the fact that no one bothered to go back and check to make sure this film was correct. But no, they didn't. And it, some of these errors do stick out like a sore thumb. 
Number seven, pre-title sequence. Another staple of James Bond films is that pre-title sequence. They're normally amazing. They're about five, 10 minutes long. Great. They're normally like a little mini film before we get the big film. Great. Except for this one was way, way too long. Oh, I'm pretty sure I said that about the main film as well. But yeah, I mean, you didn't need the whole beginning bit of that. Because in fact, that sort of just ruins the main pre-title sequence. The whole thing where she's a little girl and she's been saved by someone who's killing her father. But you know her father worked for Spectre. So you know straight away that she has been saved by someone who's against Spectre. So during the pre-title sequence when it's shown that she is a member of Spectre, you will have this doubt. It's like, well, hang on a sec, they just showed me that she wasn't. So it's too long with too much exposition that doesn't actually make sense. This pre-title sequence, if I ever did a worst to best of pre-title sequence, that's an idea for a future video, this would more than likely be right at the very bottom. Even the worst James Bond film was not have this bad of a one. Number six, Felix Leiter. Felix Leiter has been a staple of James Bond ever since the first book came out and ever since the first film came out. Each James Bond, with the exception of Pierce Brosnan, had its own Felix Leiter. I get that, and I love it. However, this film actually showed their friendship in a whole new level, and I love that. It was good, it was heartwarming. So why am I complaining about it? Well, you killed him. No, you don't kill iconic characters like that. Hell, I know in License to Kill, he got eaten by a shark, but he still survived. Granted, he was not that bothered about the death of his wife in that film, but I will bring that up if I ever do a 10 Things Wrong with License to Kill. But you don't kill off Felix Leiter. No, it, did, it just didn't sit right with me, and I didn't like that. Number five, cargo ship. So after James somehow gets out of the ship that's sinking, he goes into a life draft and he's just bobbling there. He is rescued by a cargo ship, which is sort of okay, but how the hell did that cargo ship sit? Because that was massive. They would have never picked him up on the radar. It's like, I don't know, it just, I mean, there may be a logical reason, but this film didn't show it, even though it showed so much else. But the fact that this massive, and it was a big cargo ship, managed to see this incy wincy tiny little dinghy with one person in it. It just didn't look or feel like that would happen. Number four, swearing. Now, I'm not so much of a prude that I'm against swearing. Sometimes swearing in films is good. Look at Alien 3. That has the best punch of a swear word ever. So I'm okay with swearing when it is warranted and in the type, correct type of film, which a James Bond film isn't. A James Bond film is something for the whole family because when you're a kid, you want to grow up to be James Bond. When you're a teenager, you want to be an actor so you can play James Bond. And as an adult, you'll think, I've ruined my life because I'm nothing like James Bond, but I want an Aston Martin so we can drive around singing the James Bond thing. So when M drops an F-bomb, it didn't feel right. Now, any other film that Ralph Fiennes is in, I could sort of get that, except for Harry Potter. Could you imagine Voldemort dropping the F-bomb? No, it wouldn't work. So why drop it in a James Bond film? It's like, it, no, it just didn't, same again. It wasn't James Bond. You don't drop F-bombs in a James Bond film. Number three, Child Carrier. So as James is running away with his ex, now current girlfriend that he's got back together, he's carrying the young girl who turns out to be his daughter in his arms, which I sort of get, but he's been told it's not his daughter, so he's not gonna feel overly protective. So why didn't her mother carry her? Because let's face it, James Bond, no matter what, is one of the best marksmen in the world. And you are crippling him by having one hand here People are going to go for James Bond over and above the women. I didn't quite like the fact that they were carrying, he was carrying the child. 
he, she should carry the child, he should be protecting them, that's how it should work. Also, did anyone else actually notice that the child actually looked more like Blofeld than James Bond? That's just my theory, but I did find that a bit funny. Number two, T. I am glad I didn't watch this film with my missus because if she had seen this, she would be spitting feathers about this. So they bring her a pot of tea. Okay, but the pot of tea is just hot water with different types of leaves in the mug to pour in the hot water. No, that's not how you make tea with a teapot. You put the tea bags or the tea leaves in there and then you strain it out as it's pouring out because you need time for it to brew. That's what the teapot's for. It's there to brew the cup of tea. Or is this just me being a bit too British, telling the Americans how to actually, you know, make a proper cup of tea? Because I've seen TikToks. Americans have no idea to make how to make a cup of tea. And this film actually proves that. <sighs> Also, I am sort of going out with someone who loves her tea. So yeah, that might have something to do with this as well. But yeah, it's still wrong. Number one, spoiler title. I haven't put a title. And if you're looking on YouTube, you may notice it just says spoiler down there. And it says spoiler in the chapters because I'm not going to put it on there, but I am going to talk about it. Now, if you've seen this film, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Killing James Bond. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I sort of understand, and for the story purposes, yes, it does work. And if I was in his shoes, I probably would do the same. If I couldn't touch or hug my loved ones ever again without killing them, I probably would have done what he did. However, this is a James Bond film. James Bond is the ultimate good guy. He goes in there, stops the bad guys and go home with the most sexiest woman he can find. That's how a James Bond film's supposed to be. So, it's wrong. I mean, it worked, as I said, it works for the story. It doesn't work for a James Bond film. Yeah, sorry. Whoever thought killing off James Bond was a good idea was needs to be shot. Especially as at the very end, right at the very end of this film, past all the uh, end credits, it does say James Bond returns, which... <laughs> Obviously, it's a James Bond series, but if you weren't fully into it, you're like, how can he return? You just killed him. Yeah, I'll leave it as that. Final thoughts. Watching this film, I am slightly mi have mixed emotions because when I was younger, I did enjoy watching a good James Bond film. I sort of got into it in between the Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan. So I saw most of the Pierce Brosnan films when they came out in the cinema and I enjoyed them. I can understand some of the criticism, but they were good and that's what you wanted. You go, watch a film, enjoy it, done. That was great. This whole new era where it's a little bit more dark and a little bit more gritty, what they try to do with Timothy Dalton's Bond, in one hand, yes, it does work, but it's not James Bond. That. We leave that for the Jason Bourne. The Bourne series does that to a T and it works because it's not James Bond. But in a James Bond film, no. You just, it has to be just a stereotypical one. The one problem I had with this film is I've only seen Spectre once and that's when it first came out. So a lot of this film was calling back to that film. It was like, I'm struggling to remember what happened in this film. Should I have watched Spectre before this? Possibly. Did I want to watch Spectre before watching this film? Oh, hell no. I hated Spectre. It was boring. Now, this film is a lot more enjoyable than Spectre. The soundtrack on this film actually is probably the best thing. I didn't like Billie Eilish's song when it came out, but it does work in this film. So on its own, didn't work. In the context of this, brilliant. And also having the James Bond film as horns in the background, I frigging loved that. That was brilliant. Once again, action sequences, top notch. Daniel Craig's portrayal of James Bond was a bit harsh, doesn't have as much charm and charisma, but same again, it works with this new dark and gritty version of James Bond. So he actually pulls that off really well. But I know, I've seen it before, Daniel Craig can be ultra charming. He could have pulled off like what we'd have seen in Pierce Brosnan's era. That would have worked well, but 
Same again, I'm not a big fan of this dark and gritty James Bond. To me, this isn't a James Bond film. One kudos is the fact they brought on Phoebe Waller-Bridge to do some script rewrites, and you can tell this has her fingerprints all over it, and it does work. I can't imagine how bad the script would have been without her. I think she saved this film. It's, if without her, this film would have been a lot worse, probably back down with how Spectre was. Now, there's all this speculation of who's going to be the next James Bond. I've done my own video on who could be the next James Bond, and I released that about a year ago when No Time to Die was first due out. But let's get down to what you really want to hear. What am I going to rank this out of 10? It's a good story, just not a good James Bond film. And because this is a James Bond film, that's the thing I'm gonna take into consideration the most. So I'm actually only gonna give this a five out of 10 berries. Now, I'll be honest, if this wasn't a James Bond film, because I did like the story concept, I thought that was a brilliant idea. The fact you had two warring factions fighting each other, that was interesting. The fact that it didn't work within the confines of the James Bond normality, is where it let us down. So yeah, I think 5 out of 10 is a quite a nice, respectful score. But that's my opinion. What do you think? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Let me know in the comments below. Now, on to next week. Next week, we are going to do another film that came out about the same time that I was so excited to see that I actually took my children to go and see it. Now, you lot won't have a clue what I'm on about, but it has three different versions of the same character. There's your clue. Want to know what I mean? Well, come back next week to find out. But till then, take care. Bye-bye.